All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here with us. We, the Texas Medical Center chapter of the American Society for Microbiology, are humbled and excited to bring you this COVID-19 webinar. My name is Selena Jones, and I am a PhD candidate in the genetics department at Baylor College of Medicine. We're excited to break down the science behind COVID-19 and do some myth busting in our segment today. In addition, we need a sustainable path forward, so we'll also discuss solutions to the current crisis, including testing, uh, vaccines and treatments, and then shed light on science-driven long-term solutions to ensure we are better prepared for the next pandemic. Thank you to our experts, sponsors, and everyone on our team who worked really hard to bring this together. Thank you to our audience for sending in insightful questions all week. We're hitting most of them in our webinar, but you can continue sending in questions in the live chat. If you like what you hear, please follow ASM TMC on Facebook and Twitter. And feel free to submit questions in our live chat anytime during the webinar. Our host will be answering some at the end in, uh, in our Q&A. So please stick around for that. Aisha, can you start us off? Thanks, Lena. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Aisha Khan, and I'm a clinical microbiologist and infectious diseases scientist at UT Health. Um, so with over 5.9 million global cases of COVID, uh, 2 million of those in the U.S. alone, um, and uh, 103 deaths, COVID is unlike any pandemic we've ever seen. And it's created a massive public health and economic crisis, and it's exposed serious holes in our healthcare system. Um, our most vulnerable, poor, at-risk communities have been hit the hardest which has further exacerbated already existing inequities in the system. And more importantly, um, the black community has been disproportionately hit and they are fighting on two front lines against COVID-19 and for their lives in the face of police violence, uh, which is just one aspect of over uh, 400 years of systemic racism. Um, and while black folks make up 13% of the US population, uh, they make up over 25% of COVID deaths. And in Houston, they make up over 60%, which despite that being a scary statistic, statistically young black men are still more likely to die from police violence than COVID, uh, which is why black folks and allies are out in the streets. So I wanna start by saying that we stand with you and we are cognizant of all of the issues that communities are facing, including being hit hard by COVID. Um, and as scientists, we are cognizant of our privilege and want to create the space to empower young scientists of color like you um, and give you access to data-driven answers, but also mentorship. Um, so we want to make sure that we're here for you after this webinar as well. Uh, so currently a big hurdle in our efforts to slow the spread of COVID has been this upsurge of misinformation that contradicts all scientific evidence. Uh, so Miranda, let's start myth busting. Hi everyone, I'm Miranda Lewis, a virology PhD student um, at Baylor College of Medicine, and we'll start small with the virus SARS-CoV-2 itself. I'm sure you know by now uh, what a virus is, but maybe don't really understand what they are, and that's okay. For simplicity, they are not bacteria. In fact, they're actually about 20 times smaller than bacteria on average. Um, viruses are actually non-living, whereas bacteria are. Now, when talking about different viruses, I consider those very different as well. The earliest misconception that I heard was that coronavirus is just like the flu. Yes, the flu and coronavirus are both respiratory viruses, but there are large differences between them. First of all, these viruses look nothing like each other, which means that if our immune system has seen the flu before, it would not recognize this new coronavirus at all. Second, these viruses operate in different ways, which is important when considering that we have treatments that work specifically for the flu and cannot work for SARS-CoV-2. Um, so Bailey, how have you been feeling about this pandemic? Um, so thanks, Randa. My name is Bailey and I'm a fourth year uh, PhD student in infectious disease. 
Um, and I've been feeling pretty anxious about a lot of the unknowns and the uncertainty that um, has come from this pandemic. I remember I was in high school during the H1N1 swine flu pandemic back in 2009, but I really vaguely remember it because it was nowhere near this large and it really didn't affect my daily life. But now we're all here in the middle of this global pandemic that none of us have experienced. And the only thing we really have to compare it to is movies like Contagion, which really isn't a correct depiction of real life. And recently, often on the news, we'll hear a lot of words tossed around to describe COVID-19, including outbreak, epidemic, pandemic. But what's the difference between these words? An outbreak is and an epidemic are really similar because they both happen when a new microbe and a susceptible host are present in adequate numbers. And the microbe can be uh, effectively conveyed from a source that's susceptible like another animal or a human. Um, and an outbreak is limited to a similar geographic area and an epidemic is when this outbreak spreads to a larger geographic radius. Uh, but once a new microbe, for example, viruses like COVID spread to multiple countries and continents is considered to be a pandemic. Now there's multiple factors that lead to the spread, but one is one important factor is increased rates of transmission. Do you wanna go into that, Miranda? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that um, an important factor that leads to increased transmission of any virus would be that people are traveling more. Um, in fact, airline travel has more than doubled since 2003, which is the year that the original SARS virus emerged. And this is one of the reasons why that the SARS we're dealing with now has spread so much. So um, is there anything biologically different about the virus um, itself? Uh, I think that was a question that we got quite often uh, that makes it distinct or more dangerous or, transmi or more transmissible. Um, yes, uh, something that is quite scary is that SARS-CoV-2 can spread to other people even though you don't show any symptoms. You can be infected with this virus without knowing it and spread it to others before you start to show symptoms or even if you never get symptoms. This was not the case with the original SARS and is another reason why it was much easier to contain back then. So um, moving on to another major myth that I've seen circulating on Facebook and on Instagram and even that I've chatted with some with my family and it's been reported by major news outlets is that COVID-19 is a man-made virus that was generated in a lab. And this, unfortunately, this min misconception has sparked a lot of racist attacks against Asian communities, which of course is ridiculous and terrible. Um, so Aisha, could you simply explain how scientists were able to trace the origin of SARS-CoV-2? Yeah, um, I also want to, you know, start off by saying that H1N1, which uh, we just talked about and, and Bailey talked about as, as, as us having lived that in our lifetime, um, started here um, in the United States. So it is absolutely not true that uh, viruses, this virus is man-made, and it's not true that there is something particularly uh, specific to the region itself that makes it so... Um, so likely that it would have come from there as opposed to anywhere else. A study that uh, uh, showed recently um, that the virus is uh, almost 96% identical to another coronavirus in bats. Um, and the remaining differences can be found in uh, pangolins, uh, which are these like <laughs> really adorable ant eating mammals. Um, and so the way they did this is they compared the genomes or the genetic code of different viruses and tried to trace the origins of where it comes from. Um, so it's been thoroughly debunked that it is not, in fact, a man-made virus made in a lab. Awesome. So I'm glad we're all on the same page about how um, the COVID-19 outbreak happened. And as we move into the intense summer heat here in Houston specifically, it made us think about another myth that heat is able to kill COVID. Uh, Miranda, is there any merit to this? Are scientists and epidemiologists uh, able to test or predict how weather can affect the spread of a certain disease? Um. Yeah, so the idea that heat kills viruses is, is very misleading. In a laboratory, we can boil the virus and show that it loses infectivity, though we're not standing outside in heat strong enough to boil our blood. Um, and so we can also test whether temperature in the lab can affect the, abil uh, the ability of a virus to spread. Um, However, these are in laboratory settings, um, very controlled and with um, experimental animals. So the uh, uh, results of these uh, can be somewhat limited. But yes, 
um, every time that we cough, sneeze, breathe, or even talk, we create these microscopic droplets um, called respiratory droplets that the virus can travel in and float through the air. Um, and so this is what is being spread. Um, and so it's thought that in the winter, um, the air outside is colder and drier, which makes, uh, which creates a more favorable condition for these droplets to travel through the air. Another factor in the winter um, is a more social one. We're in school, we're visiting families for the holidays, or trying to stay indoors because it's just so cold outside. And so we're close to each other uh, compared to the summer when you're probably hanging around a lot less people. That's really interesting and that makes a lot of sense. Um, so of course, there's a lot of reasons why COVID-19 was able to jump from an outbreak to a full-blown pandemic so fast. A big reason is COVID's high rate of transmission and spread. So scientists use a metric called an r naught to determine how contagious an infectious disease is. So for example, if you think about the seasonal flu that we get a flu shot for every year, that has a rate of spread about of about 1.3 to two, meaning that one person that is infected with the flu is likely to infect one to two more people. Um, when the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic be began, the estimated transmission rate for COVID was actually lower than it is estimated to be now. Aisha, why is it complicated to determine the transmission rate for COVID-19? Well, uh, first, it's really difficult to study a never before seen virus in the middle of an emerging pandemic because it's causing infections while we're still learning about it. Normally what we do to know how fast the virus is spreading is we identify people that display a certain type of symptoms and we use diagnostic tools to detect the virus and confirm that they actually have that infection. And then we deploy community surveillance, uh, which is known as contact tracing. And then we can actually isolate people that we know are infected. And that usually is sufficient for us to be able to curb spread of a virus, except we just didn't know at the beginning how bad COVID really was. For example, like Miranda said, we didn't know that people without symptoms were actually getting sick a lot more than we thought and they were spreading infections um, and causing infections as well because of the spread of the virus. Um, so right now we have an idea that what we originally thought uh, was the transmission rate, it's actually five times higher than that. And that's just because we're understanding that a lot of people in the community already had it a long before uh, we thought uh, we saw community spread. Um, but we're doing better. We have a lot more data. We have a lot more tools. And we're getting those better estimates now because we're starting to understand how this works. Um, and a lot of that, again, is understanding how it's transmitting from one person to the other. So it can transmit uh, person to person, but also from contact with contaminated surfaces. So I know people saw studies that um, indicated that SARS-CoV-2 could live in the air for three hours on surfaces uh, like glass or metal for up to five days. Um, so Miranda, I was wondering if you could kind of go into whether that's something very specific to SARS-CoV-2 um, and if that's true in terms of persistence on surfaces. Um, yes, so it is true that COVID-19 can last on surfaces like cardboard, door handles, and other surfaces um, for days. Um, and so what this is called when uh, the virus can last on a surface um, is called fomites. Um, but the longer the virus sits on whatever surface, its virulence or how infectious the virus is decreases. A major problem is when we touch surfaces and then go to touch our face, including our eyes, our nose, et cetera. And I know I'm guilty of doing this. Uh, and so this directly brings the virus to a mucosal membrane, your mouth, nose, um, eyes. Um, and this is why it's so important to remember not to touch our faces and hand sanitize and wash our hands regularly. Um, like I should mention, uh, COVID-19 is transmit, uh, transmitted through respiratory droplets, which is the transmission route we should be more concerned about. And that's why public health measures like wearing masks and social distancing are important. No, that definitely um, makes sense and totally um, is something that I know I need to work on, be more cognizant of like touching my face and stuff like that, but it's, and that is important to wear a mask. Uh, Aisha, can you, um, help us break down what the clinical picture looks like now on the ground and on the front lines since we're a couple months into this pandemic and it's been something that's now a really prominent part of all of our lives. Yeah, so the biggest question we get asked is how do I know if I have COVID-19? 
And this is, this is hard to answer because there's been so many myths suggesting that people can self-diagnose by doing things like holding their breath for 30 seconds. And any of that is not true. Whatever you've heard, it's not true. The only way to diagnose you with COVID is to get tested for it and do so by a medical professional. Um, and people have wondered why we can't provide them with a list of telltale symptoms that make it really obvious that you have COVID. And it's hard because again, when we're dealing with the new virus, understanding symptoms and severity and targets and hosts are largely still a mystery. So we do know that the most common symptoms are fever. For example, that's reported in around 90% of, of cases, dry cough, shortness of breath, um, which is comes along with chest pain, chills, muscle pain. And you know, recently it was brought to light that there would be a new loss of taste or smell in some individuals. Um, and again, that's that varies. All of these symptoms vary from person to person and depending on the severity of the illness that they're experiencing. So I know that you've been working on coordinating COVID testing in Houston to diagnose infections, but how difficult was it to early on diagnose people based off of these symptoms? And do we now have a more accurate idea of COVID incubation period, infectious period, and who it targets specifically? Yeah, uh, and just because I, I think it's important for, for us to recognize the steps that are involved in diagnosing someone with COVID. So when someone, for example, goes to the ER with symptoms of an active infection, um, physicians assess those symptoms and order diagnostic tests that then get sent to the clinical microbiology lab, where our job is to then determine what pathogen is infecting that patient. Um, however, the symptoms that we see for COVID are extremely common and overlap with a lot of viral respiratory infections. So it's really difficult for doctors to know for sure, just based on symptoms alone, that someone has COVID or not. That's why diagnostics and testing are such an important part of being able to be sure whether someone has an infection or not. Thank you for that wonderful explanation, Aisha. Um, now that we have a bit more data on the virus, do we have more accurate info about how SARS-CoV-2 infects people and who it targets? Uh, so SARS-CoV-2 um, is unique a little bit in, in that we're learning more information about how respiratory viral infections can differ from each other but it enters the body through the upper respiratory tract. So that's your nose, throat, and eyes. And then it takes on average for people around five days from the point of exposure for symptoms to actually emerge. And again, keep in mind, that's if symptoms emerge at all. Um, and this part is called the incubation period where you don't know you're sick, but you're still spreading it because you're infectious. And in that time, uh, there's a lag because uh, it invades cells, but that's when it starts to make more copies of itself. And usually at this stage, if you are a healthy person, your body's immune system kicks in and tries to eradicate the virus. Uh, but in patient who uh, we call high risk, these are older folks with underlying health conditions and people who have chronic issues like lung disease, asthma, cardiac issues, diabetes, immunocompromised patients. The virus then is able to make it past that point and replicate and sp spread to the lungs, for example. Um, and that's when symptoms really, really escalate and that's when you have a severe COVID infection. And once it gets to the lungs, the immune system can then go into overdrive and instead of just attacking the virus, it attacks your own body. And that can lead to damaging of your lungs, which ultimately leads to organ failure. So people can be experiencing, again, a huge spectrum of symptoms or no symptoms at all. And it's really difficult to deal with a pandemic like that. Uh, people are infectious uh, for about one to three days before they even get sick. So again, that's the problem that they're spreading without knowing that they're sick. And they remain contagious for around 10 days after uh, symptoms resolve. But that can vary because people who are sicker remain infectious for longer because they just have more viruses in their upper respiratory tract. And again, the answer always varies from person to person because the actual infection varies. And um, on that note, I guess uh, I wanted to kind of move on from the clinical picture to talking about what we can all do to be doing our part in curtailing the spread of the virus. And I'm sure we've learned about all of these public health measures that are increasingly important. Uh, but what was really different about COVID is uh, before when SARS emerged, for example, in 2003, uh, what worked in containing it was they identified people that had symptoms because most people displayed symptoms and then they isolated them and quarantined them. 
So they didn't have to put these drastic measures and shut everything down and, and, and ask people to stay home to this extent. And in eight months, uh, SARS -CoV, SARS um, in 2003, the first SARS, um, affected uh, 8,000 people in specific geographic areas. COVID in less than five months infected, infected over 3 million people. Um, so it really comes down to there being so many people that are asymptomatic, which means that they're not showing signs of infection, or pre-symptomatic, which means that they're not sick yet, but still spreading the virus. Okay, so because of these high rates of asymptomatic infections, that's been a big problem. Um, I've seen reports from certain people um, and news outlets that it might be possible that COVID has been, quote, blown out of proportion where the majority of the population has already seen it or had it. So the real death rates are actually a lot lower, are low since proportionally not many people are dying. Is there any truth to this? Uh Absolutely not. Even though I can see where that might come from, where that myth might come from, uh, in the U.S., our testing rates have been so low that we're not actually testing enough people in our population to be able to really understand how many people have been exposed to COVID or currently have COVID. Um, but for scale, uh, during we all understand flu season, right? And and in the the peak flu season uh, in previous year, years, recent years, uh, in a single week the most number of people that could have died, again, this is the worst case scenario, anywhere between 350 to 1,600 people. For COVID, the peak week, which was in April, nearly 30,000 people died in a week. So that's just scale for how different COVID is. Its mortality rate is at least 20 times higher than the flu. And this is just not a guess. And I understand why people would think so, but we're getting that information and more accurate uh, accurate data from countries where they've done studies where they actually have tested a huge portion of their population and they're able to understand how many people have it and therefore how many people are getting really sick and how many people are dying. So that's where we're getting our reliable mortality estimates from rather than just guessing based on the US. Okay. Cool. That was a great explanation. Thank you for that. Um, so I know another thing um, that many people and people, my peers and other people who I've talked to, my family, are confused about uh, why all these increased public health measures are in place for COVID-19, especially since they've never been this strict in previous outbreaks. So why do we need to do this now with all the social distancing, the masking, etc.? And one phrase that's been thrown around um, on social media, I've seen it on billboards driving around Houston and um, in the media, is the need to flatten the curve. So Miranda, quickly for those who might not know, what does flatten the curve mean exactly? Uh, yes. So flattening the curve um, is what I'm sure we've all heard of, but maybe don't understand. Um, it's an extremely important aspect um, to this pandemic. So this is a public health strategy used to spread out the amount of new cases that are occurring each day to prevent a, an exponential or rapidly increase in cases. Um, and so a lower steady flood of cases over time, uh, rather than in a short amount of time, allows for the healthcare system to be able to respond effectively. Because if we have too many people show up, um, too many people getting sick at once, there's not enough room in the hospitals for our doctors to take care of them. And which was a huge problem for Italy towards the beginning of the pandemic, where they resulted to using uh, wartime, um, uh, I forget the word, uh, but they basically um, pick and chose which patient was most likely to survive and to treat them and give them the proper health care rather than treating everyone. So we don't want to be in that dangerous situation. Right. Um, we don't want to have this clogging up with the healthcare system where we have to move to a triage situation where we have to pick who lives or dies based off of who gets the ventilator. Um, and we don't want to hit that max surge capacity in hospitals. So that's why social distancing is important. Uh, another myth I've heard circulating around is that masks really don't do anything to help the spread, help with the spread of the virus. Um, Amanda, uh, Miranda, could you explain why the CDC changed their guidelines now to ask everyone to wear a mask when they're in close contact with other people? 
Um, yeah, um, and I, even I was guilty of this, thinking that masks won't work. Um, but in the beginning, we did not know that people were asymptomatic, but still spreading COVID. And because of that, there was no need for everybody to wear a mask because we assumed that only visually sick people would spread the virus. And those people who are sick would be staying at home. So after more data came out showing that this virus can be transmitted from people who show no symptoms, the CDC changed its guidelines to ask everyone to wear masks. Now, how masks reel in uh, respiratory droplets and keep them within the mask, rather than um, droplets traveling in the air and infecting uh, other people. So please wear your masks um, when you go out in public. Uh, related to that topic, um, especially in the past month here in Texas and throughout the United States, there's been a major push to reopen America. Um, Texas relaxed the lockdown and opened up public spaces like restaurants and bars to up to 50% capacity uh, with social distancing measures in place. There's several myths driving these policy changes, and one of them is that the virus will just fade away. Uh, which I believe refers to it mutating to be less dangerous or that we've flattened the curve so things are over. However, experts like um, Anthony Fauci have warned that the US, the U.S. might experience a second wave of infections uh, and of COVID cases. Do you think there will be a second wave and how can we actually predict this, um, that if COVID could fade away? Uh, Aisha, could you give some insight uh, on yeah, that? Yeah, so... It is uh, possible, and this is extremely normal um, in general for uh, microbes that they evolve. And as they evolve, they can mutate and they can mutate to become less dangerous or less pathogenic. However, this is not a process that happens relatively quickly where our life will just return to normalcy so fast. Uh, this virus is not going away and it's only going to go away if sufficient por proportion of our population is immune to it. And that's called herd immunity, where we're no longer transmitting it because enough of us are not susceptible to infection. Um, and that's the problem that we haven't hit that threshold at this point. And it is really, really unclear whether people um, that are sick and recovering are actually protected from a secondary infection. Um, and that's essentially why we're so worried about a second wave coming in because if we're going back and returning to normal and still not uh, enforcing any kind of restraint in where we go and how we interact with people and um, just not following public health measures anymore, that can lead to, again, where we're back to square one, where we're transmitting again and things are reaching peak and there's we're hitting surge capacity where hospitals are overwhelmed. Um, so again, I think it's important, but, um, this is something that we need to be cognizant of, even in the context of, for example, with protests right now. Um, I'm sure people are wondering that we're in the middle of a pandemic and we're having to, to do this, right, to have to advocate for um, Black lives and how are we going to do that safely, right? It's a difficult question, but I think now we have a lot of scientists and physicians that are coming together to inform people about tips that they can take and measures that they can take to be safe as they're exercising. Um, their right to, to protest. For example, again, Randa went into great detail about wearing masks. That is the one of the most important ways you can curtail transmission. Um, so following those basic measures is still going to go a long way. Um, so now I want to talk about diagnostics because um, this is something that uh, is really important in understanding how uh, how much the virus is around, um, should we be reopening the country and all that. And I've heard that, you know, there's myths about testing as well. So Aisha, a myth circulated on my own social media uh, feed and news outlets like CNN early on that testing for COVID is easy. Anyone can do it. Um, could you tell us if this is true and what does it take to develop tests in the middle of an outbreak? Uh, so when most people talk about diagnosing people with COVID, uh, what they're talking about is a PCR test, which detects for the presence of genetic material from the virus SARS-CoV-2 or the RNA itself, but not the live virus. And developing and running COVID testing was not easy and it was very complex. 
largely, again, because you're having to develop testing for a virus that you've never seen before. So you don't know how infections work, you don't know who's getting infected, and you don't know what the best way to actually detect that virus is. Um, so when COVID hit, um, we normally, how this works is we have a very rigorous approval process uh, overseen by the Food and Drug Administration before a test can be deployed. And the same goes for vaccines or treatments. However, in the middle of a crisis, we're able to kind of green light things faster with emergency use authorization, but that still means you need to demonstrate that the test is sensitive and specific so you can pick up the lowest amount of virus and you're not picking up another virus that's not SARS-CoV-2. And the entire process of putting that together and coming up with an accurate test that can help patients and not hurt them and not provide false negatives, for example, which is when they're actually positive, but the test result came out as negative, those can be really, really, really dangerous. So besides doing everything we can to help patients, we also are trying constantly to do no harm. And that's why this is such a difficult process. Uh, great, thank you for that. And so to reopen this country gradually, a major proposed solution has to uh, has been to perform antibody testing to determine if people are immune, which is uh, different from the PCR test that you've mentioned. Um, so can you explain uh, exactly what is a serology test and are there any limitations to serology testing? Yeah, um, so like I, like I said, with diagnosing the virus itself, it's a PCR test. But a serology test uh, is detecting for antibodies which are made in your blood uh, around one to two weeks after you've been exposed to a virus. Um, there are not a lot of studies on antibodies and whether they protect against COVID-19 infection, uh, which makes it really hard for us to make any claims about what serology tests mean. And initially when serology tests came out, there were actually a lot of problems with a lot of unreliable, uh, inaccurate tests being on the market because of the lack of FDA oversight. So even if you do have a very accurate test, um, if you test positive, for example, um, for a SARS-CoV-2 antibody test, it means that you might have been infected sometime in the recent past. But we don't know if those antibodies detected are going to provide you immunity and prevent a future infection. Um, it also does not necessarily mean you're not contagious anymore because you could still be making antibodies and still be actively shedding the virus. And you could get a false positive what that means is you are told you're positive, but in fact, you don't have antibodies that are specific to SARS-CoV-2, but they're specific to another human coronavirus, which are normally circulating and are normally causing uh, the common cold and infections like that. So we're already exposed to them. Uh, and that might give you a false sense of security. Um, so I think that's all these caveats that we need to think of. And we're not there yet where we're really able to tell people, okay, positive test means yes, you're immune. But I think serology is really important for surveillance. Uh, for example, we really need to get a better idea of, because we were so behind on testing, um, why uh, or how many people really in the US have been exposed and infected uh, previously. And if we're actually looking for antibodies, we might be able to kind of make up that lost ground and figure out what the real mortality rate is in the US. So that's what I think they're really useful for at this stage, as opposed to just giving people antibody tests to tell them if they can go back to work or not, for example. Wow, that was a really super clear answer. Thank you for that. Um, Cause now we know a little bit of the difference between like PCR test and a serology test and why it's important to make sure that, you know, there's good regulation on all of these different types of testing when we're trying to look at the spread and um, immunity in this pandemic. Uh, besides tests, um, there are new vaccines and clinical trials that are also in the works to be able to be provide solutions for this current crisis. Uh, Miranda, could you tell us a little bit about some of those and where they're at right now? Uh, of course. Um, so you're right, uh, this virus is not going anywhere and the only way it won't pose a major threat to us is if we reach herd immunity, which means that a sufficient portion of the population is immune to the virus where it cannot transmit any longer. And this can happen with an effective vaccine. 
However, the process to get there is long, um, on average, 10 to 15 years for a scientist to develop a vaccine against a virus, then prove it's effective in animals and humans through clinical trials, and also has to show that it does not have significant side effects. We're trying to do this in less than two years. Um, there's eight uh, vaccines currently in clinical trials, and even in a best case scenario, we will not have one till the summer of 2021. Um, so, Aisha, what about treatments to cure COVID um, until we can wait for this vaccine to be ready? So, there are no FDA approved cures or treatments for COVID as of now. And again, it's really important when we talk about treatments to make sure we're not spreading misinformation. If a drug has not been rigorously tested in clinical trials, like, Amanda, uh, like Miranda just talked about. Um, for example, um, I'm sure uh, people have been watching the news often and trying to keep up with what folks are talking about in terms of recommended treatments. And politicians have been mentioning hydroxychloroquine or HCQ, uh, which is an anti-malarial drug uh, or used for other uh, approved conditions like rheumatoid, uh, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus um, as a option or a miracle cure for COVID. Uh, however, there has been uh, absolutely no evidence to show that. And in fact, there was a rigorous clinical trial that was conducted and with a large uh, cohort of people with a lot of patients uh, that showed that not only was it not effective, but it did in that trial at least lead to increased mortality in patients who were put on it. Uh, however, at that point, HCQ had already been in the news and been talked about for months. And that's the problem. But besides that, there are innovative treatments that scientists worked on that are now already in clinical trials. So for example, there's drugs that are meant to target and eliminate the virus itself, which are called antivirals. An example that you might've heard is remdesivir. Um, however, um, results from studies like that are still mixed. So we're waiting on a really big study that can give us a definitive answer. There's also experimental treatments that target that hyperactive immune response that I talked about where your immune system is kicked into overdrive and essentially destroying your lungs and causing this inflammation uh, like Actemra. And they are meant to reduce that inflammation to give your body a better chance. And there's also treatments, uh, experimental treatments that are meant to boost your immune system so you can potentially eliminate the virus. Um, and that's done uh, in clinical trials right now by transplanting covalescent plasma, uh, which has antibodies from someone who successfully recovered from COVID infection. So you would think that they have antibodies that could eliminate the virus and transplant them to someone with an active infection and see if there's any protective effect. Um, and either way, all of them have had mixed results so far, which is why we haven't been able to definitively say that this is the treatment for COVID. And when that happens, we're going to be able to get it through reliable, rigorous, larger studies. Thank you for that wonderful explanation, Aisha. Um, so we recognize that all these moving parts need to come together to form a cohesive healthcare system. But we have so many experts in America who can craft solutions. Why was it not enough for us to adequately respond to the pandemic? Yeah, and I think that's what we kind of want to focus a lot of our uh, questions on uh, to talk about where we go from here. And it is really, really hard for us to talk about the science behind COVID and where we go from here and solutions without talking about what got us here in the first place, uh, which is all of the underlying health disparities and social inequities that created this crisis. So despite the US being a leader in research and medical innovation, uh, the US clearly lagged severely in our response to the pandemic, especially for the first couple of months, which cost us a lot. So to be able to really prevent an outbreak early, what you need is to be able to have meticulous leadership and coordination at every level of the government where we're able to respond fast and respond to accurate evidence-based science and escalate stringency of public health measures early, but also be able to address all of the issues that come with that. Uh, and what comes with that is if people are losing their jobs and have no access to health insurance, for example, that we need to figure out a way that we're going to be providing for them if we're asking them to stay home. And our healthcare system is broken and it's always been 
a system that's very profit driven. And we have over 30 million uninsured people in the US which are afraid to get sick because they just can't afford to get COVID. So when people are afraid to get tested, afraid to go to the ER, that also leads to an exacerbation of transmission. And we need to talk about the economic impact this has had because millions of people are suffering from unemployment. And like we said at the beginning, marginalized communities are hit the hardest. So their anger is justified. And life-saving public health policies are not just going to be the answer because there's a lot of misdirected anger at scientists because we ask for these policies. But even though these policies are scientifically backed to be effective, people can't be forced to stay home without livelihoods or access to social services, universal health care if they fall sick, hazard pay for frontline workers, and really provisions for people to be able to weather the storm. So we understand this, and what we need to talk about is long-term systemic change, uh, where we need to talk about what we can do moving forward to change those fundamental systems that led to this public health crisis in the first place, where we're able to have a better, better pandemic preparedness system in place. And hopefully that we're also able to address all of those social inequities uh, that people sometimes don't notice when we're not actively in the middle of a pandemic because those communities aren't really given that time and attention. So I think it's, it's part of a huge systemic, systemic problem and science is at the forefront of it, but so is science informing public policy. I think it's all, something that comes together where we can really able to push for healthcare and policy reform in the long term. Okay, great. So now that we've laid the groundwork for talking about the path of moving forward, we're going to hand it over to Selena to moderate questions from our webinar Google form and from the Zoom, Facebook Live and YouTube chats. So if you could just take it away for us, Selena. Yeah, thank you. And thank you to our great hosts for uh, everything that they've been able to tell us already today. One of our questions that we got um, from the form was how, so with coming up with a vaccine now and um, some maybe things are going faster than normally they are while producing a vaccine, um, how wise is it to like potentially mass produce this vaccine while we're still learning what its effects are? And any one of you can uh, answer that. Yeah, so that's a great question and I think um, that a lot, we can talk about it in the perspective of, of what it takes to develop a vaccine. And uh, we kind of talked about this, but it starts at the bench uh, where we are trying to study parts of the virus and what parts of the virus are conserved where there's very little variation across different strains, for example, and then identify that one commonality that we can build, an, build a vaccine against that would give people that are vaccinated a robust immune response. So, there is sufficient amount of knowledge so far on what strains that are circulating have in common. And based on that, uh, there's different approaches that a lot of different researchers have taken. It's not all the same type of vaccine. They, tar they have different targets. And with that comes a chance that there's going to be different efficacy. So not only are some of them targeting, for example, uh, proteins on the surface of the virus, some of them are targeting mRNA some of them are targeting, uh, are targeting um, other components of the virus. So I think we need to uh, keep in mind that we know enough to be able to figure out what is a good target. And that's the idea of coming up with multiple vaccine candidates because you don't know which one will stick. And that's the hope that they go through phase one, phase two, and phase three, and come out of phase three and we have the clinical trial data to know which is performed the best. And that's, that's, I think, a valid approach that we're gonna take right now. And we really don't have an option because even losing a month can cost us a lot of lives. So this is the best that we have right now and that's what we're working with. Yeah, I'd just like to add really quickly um, that we shouldn't expect that the first vaccine that will be um, uh, approved will be our best and only one. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, it, this is not uh, even the case during a pandemic either. Um, new vaccines are developed over time because maybe they don't last uh, in, uh, uh, like for example, in um, resource limited countries that don't have great um, refrigeration and they can't preserve the vaccines as well. Um, maybe a new vaccine would come along um, and uh, be more resistant to the heat and 
be more efficacious in that case. Um, or again, um, as Aisha said, uh, another vaccine would be more efficacious. So um, initially we'll use what we have and it's uh, efficacious at the time, but as soon as we learn more information and um, get better vaccines, then we'll be moving on to those. Awesome, thank you for your answers. Um, another question that we have was, so now as uh, cities are reopening, um, and uh, people are going back to work and different things. Um, some uh, buildings are uh, doing temperature checks at the at the front where people have to have, uh, yeah, they, they get their temperature checked before they're allowed in. Uh, so how helpful is that uh, for, like if someone is actually asymptomatic, could they be um, contagious but not showing any symptoms? So they may not have um, a high temperature and along with that, how safe are enclosed office buildings if they have recirculated air? Um, I can take a step at this one. So um, yes, you're right. It is dangerous that uh, uh, asymptomatic people who won't have a fever, they won't be um, uh, triggering that temperature check at buildings. So it, it's very important that these people wear masks um, so that their um, virus um, that they can release is contained in those masks. Um, and, uh, uh, oh, I had an answer to the second question as well. Could you repeat the second one real quick? Yeah, the second question is how safe are enclosed office buildings that have recirculated air? Oh, yes, I have a great answer for this. So um, this virus is predominantly spread through respiratory droplets and not aerosolized. So this means that um, the virus stays in these uh, liquid droplets and those can only travel for about six feet um, whereas aerosolized means the virus can spread further than six feet um, and so while we say six feet is um, the standard and that's actually the recommendation by CDC uh, this isn't um, a hard uh, uh, a hard number because it has been reported that in China a restaurant has been opened um, and there was an asymptomatic person who was having lunch with his family and actually infected uh, several other people that were also in the restaurant and so the Chinese CDC had tested um, air vents um, and surfaces and all that um, so they knew that the virus was not going through circulation of the air vents, but it was, um, they think that the air from the, from the air vents was pushing the, the respiratory droplets further than that six uh, feet. So it is something to consider when you're in indoors rather than outside. And I, I want to add to the part that Miranda talked about in terms of aerosolizing procedures. So uh, I know that at the beginning when we were trying to understand how the virus transmits, there was a lot of scary information out there and people didn't know how to parse between what it meant to be a, like a droplet and, and an aerosol. So it is a concern in hospitals, for example, where um, healthcare workers are often conducting aerosol generating procedures to patients that are actively infected with COVID. Um, and this can be an intubation, a bronchoscopy, but those are those are specifically generating these fine mist particles that can, like Miranda said, carry the virus way beyond what we're expecting with respiratory droplets. So it is a concern within those spaces and within those environments. Uh, but we and most of us are not exposed to aerosolized procedures and we in our offices are not normally thinking of that uh, thinking of that so i think it's important to remember what to learn when things are pertinent and not um because it's hard to sometimes parse through all of the information just through articles okay great thank you uh, so another quick question let's say you had you, you had COVID 19 but you just had a mild case uh, and you recover does this mean you are now immune no. no, so simply speaking, um, because it's a brand new, um, you know, this is a brand new virus, something that we haven't seen before. It's like we mentioned before with serology testing, it's really hard to tell how much of um, like how infected or how much exposure you need to be able to be fully immune to the virus. So it's right now we're trying to work out serology testing and you know we might be able to say like hey you were exposed to COVID-19 but there's no way of knowing really um you know how 
much of an exposure you need at this point to be able to show if you're truly immune. So that's why it's important, like why it's so important that we're working on different um, vaccine strategies and still trying to maintain social distancing and still being careful. It's important to not have a false sense of security. Um, the one, uh, it's, while it's really, really hard for us to kind of draw information from, from a new virus, I think the reason people are still pursuing antibody testing in, in terms of scientists developing a good antibody test and really focusing their energy on it um, is because we have information about prior, uh, previous SARS-CoV viruses um, and have some information about the coronavirus family and how um, antibody production has occurred, at least in those cases of infection. Um, so a lot of the information that we know is, is being drawn from that. Um, so for example, with the previous SARS pandemic in 2003, there were studies that showed um, that a good proportion of patients with active infections ended up having IgG antibodies, which are, the, which are antibodies that you're looking for to look for this type of immunity. Um, up to two years after infection, but they became undetectable around six years after infection. So that's short-term immunity as opposed to long-term immunity. So those, that sort of information is so hard for us to understand without actually carrying that study out for six years, right? Um, or even two years to know if there's even a short-term immunity. But those studies are being carried out right now. Mm -hmm. People are looking to see if those antibodies that are produced are one, giving them, in, uh, giving people immunity if they stay uninfected and don't have secondary infection and how long those antibodies are detectable um, in, their, um, in their blood. So I think we're gonna learn a lot soon. Great. Um, so another question for hospital workers, people who are consistently being exposed to COVID patients on, um, on a regular basis, even if they're using all the right PPE and following regulations, how likely is it that they will contract the disease and what are the best ways for them to prevent it? Okay, I think that's a good, uh, on that note, I think we can talk about um, all of the issues with healthcare workers and the position that they're kind of put in right now. Um, to be able to struggle with these shortages. So there's not just a shortage of tests. That's a huge issue, right? A shortage of basic protective gear where medical workers are having to recycle and reuse material that they're not supposed to be reusing. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, one, we weren't able to direct funding, emergency funding when the pandemic hit to be able to uh, channel our supply chain and start producing the, the, the amount of protective equipment that we really need. And that's what a lot of other countries started to do. They responded very early. We did redirected funding where it needed to go and had um, systems in place that were ready to respond to an emergency like this. So that's really the issue where right now, even for tests, for example, we don't, we have test shortages and we have shortages of the swabs that we use to even take a sample from patients that we're counting how many we have every day, right? Um, at hospitals, uh, what's happening is they're forced into uh, bidding wars, essentially, where there's market competition and they're scrambling to get supplies. So if one of them gets them, that's because they probably bid higher and are able to afford them as opposed to another local uh, community hospital that doesn't have the funds to be able to secure the supplies. So what are they able to do to protect themselves? I think I want to kind of reframe that question into what should we be doing to be protecting our healthcare workers on the front lines? Uh, because as we see right now, um, you know, we do have the funding to be able to direct a lot of money towards policing of these protests. And we need to be able to use that same level of urgency and that same level of um, timeliness to be able to redirect that to actually protect our healthcare workers. So I think they're trying their best to do everything they can, which is that they are um, finding ways to sterilize PPE, I think, and being creative about it, um, autoclaving things, heating things, boiling things. Um, but even despite all of that, they are exposed to such high viral loads, like they're exposed to so many patients that are really sick, right? These are not the asymptomatic patients. These are not people that are slightly ill because they just stay at home and self-isolate. These are really sick patients. And that's why uh, now there's studies looking into if there's a higher rate um, of severe COVID cases in healthcare workers, regardless of age. And there are other countries that have shown that healthcare workers, even if they are young and previously healthy, that they are falling extremely sick and showing up to the ICU. And 
it's leading to a lot of serious, serious issues on, on that front uh, because you're losing your healthcare capacity and your healthcare workers are getting sick and you don't have enough capacity to take care of your patients then. Oh, yeah, thank you for that um, full response. Um, kind of along those lines, uh, when a vaccine is finally developed and being produced, uh, do we know our frontline workers going to be the first ones to receive it? Or who, who would it, what are the priorities on who gets the vaccine? If we know. Yeah, that's a hard question. I don't think that there would be any uh, sort of prioritizing unless that's needed in some bill or uh, it's what the manufacturers prefer or what the hospitals are going to do because they'll be buying them um, in clinics as well to disseminate them. Um, I mean, that kind of sheds light on uh, the problem with having uh, this kind of healthcare system it, because the, uh, having a vaccine is essential. Like considering how dangerous this virus is, everyone needs to be vaccinated. If only a small portion of us are, um, then we're not going to reach that herd immunity and, um, uh, and then we'll just be um, prolonging this pandemic further. Um, so we need uh, one for this vaccine to be cheap so that everyone can access it um, or second just have it totally free so that everyone can have it um, yes. so that's uh, my take on who's getting the vaccine um, but at this point we don't know that answer um, just who can buy it I guess yeah thank you so um, currently in hospitals, many other procedures have been limited, like the ones that are considered non-essential or non-emergency. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? How it, what are the other health impacts that this is having? Maybe not directly COVID related, but um, further consequences of uh, limiting what we're able to do in hospitals right now. Um, do you think this is still what we should be practicing or uh, just what are some of the other consequences that are coming uh, on our health from from all of our response? Um, I can start and then other people can um, kind of jump in with this. But I think there are some different um, consequences that have occurred from having to, you know, lock things down and not do more non-essential um procedures, particularly in places that don't have as many resources. So for example, in the medical center, we have, a, you know, although we're still having to fight over getting enough PPE for our employees and our frontline workers, they still have more access to things than a community hospital would or a more rural area would, for example. Um, so I think that that kind of sheds a light on some health disparities that are occurring in our country where, um, depending on where you live or your neighborhood or, you know, other different demographic factors, you could be more vulnerable to having other health problems or not being able to get the care that you need. However, like the major problem I think that needs to be addressed is that there was no, um, that we weren't prepared for something like this, that the government hadn't prioritized like being prepared for a pandemic where we could still continue to provide these um, essential things that you know, more things that were not essential a couple months ago are now becoming essential. So I think now a major thing is trying to be able to protect people as much as we can while also taking care of more urgent matters, for example, those who need cancer treatment or have chronic diseases, stuff like that, to make sure we're protecting them, but also protecting our frontline workers as well. Um, and uh, we're already doing that. Like we're coming up with algorithms uh, to find a way to be able to give people uh, elective procedures and to find people to get, get back into doctor's offices and get back to their treatments on time. Um, and that's by testing both the patient receiving treatment and the clinical provider. Um, and we uh, first make sure that we get two tests that come back negative before we know for sure that, you know, it's okay to perform that procedure. And that I think is a reliable way to do things and safe way to do things. Um, but again, we're going to have to, if we really want to get back to 100%, then we need that number of tests because that is a lot of people that we're testing. And those aren't even the people that are sick, right? Because we have been facing issues giving enough tests to people that come in and are actually sick. 
So um, if we can scale that up, then I think we can definitely be able to provide for all of the medical needs that, that, that are now definitely essential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. So another question that we received is, what if uh, one of your family members or someone that you live with gets sick? What is the, uh, there, you know, there's lots of talk um, about how important it is to use face masks and social distancing, but if it's someone you live with, um, what are truly the best ways to uh, protect yourself and also to care for that individual? Um, yeah, and this is uh, definitely a concern because we can't really, you know, some of us are not privileged to just leave the house or maybe we're a caretaker for that person. Um, so it's, you know, I think you know the um, necessity of washing your hands, uh, uh, keeping masks on and everything like that, but just heighten it. Um, it's best if you have uh, an extra room for the person who is sick to isolate in that room um, and really just stay in there. Uh, you who are living with them should be providing their food. And if you really like to just leave it out uh, on the door and then they can come out later and uh, pick it up from outside the door. Um, you know, sanitize those doorknobs um, and things like that. And like I mentioned earlier, I wouldn't worry too much about COVID traveling through the air vents. It's just um, like a fan blowing um, that would be of concern. Thank you. Uh, so again, now that we kind of touched on this, but now that um, businesses are reopening and people are uh, gathering in larger groups than we have in the last few months, um, and there's movement. Will COVID-19 ever end now that people are being exposed to other people and <laughs> things will continue to pass along? What, what is that? How is this going to end and when will that happen? That's my favorite question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when will this end? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, we want it to end so bad. We I promise like, you. <laughs> we wish this never existed. Um, but yeah, uh, it's, you know, it really depends. And like what we've said before, we just don't have the answers of how good immunity is. So, you know, it is possible to get rid of a virus completely. We've done it before. Humanity has done it. Um, uh, smallpox is completely yes. eradicated so much that we don't even take the vaccine for it anymore. Um, and polio, while it's not completely eradicated in a couple number of countries, the vaccination has been so great that um, uh, the majority of the world population has uh, uh, prevented or has stopped polio infection. Um, and so if we get this same type of great immunity towards COVID-19, then we can fully expect that uh, we can vaccinate everyone um, and achieve that herd immunity. Um, but also, and like I've mentioned before, we need this vaccine to be cheap um, so that not just America um, gets the vaccine, but other countries that uh, may not have the resources to access it. And if you think like, oh, it's fine if I just can get a booster every year, whatever, I'll pay for it. It doesn't matter because people travel and then they come back to America or you're traveling and you can get uh, exposed and sick again if that is the case of there not being enough long-term immunity. So it's either or. Um, it is possible that the virus can adapt to humans, kind of mellow out and mutate so that each infection um, is more mild and not as severe. Um, and actually that has been documented before where new viruses that emerge from animals can be uh, very dangerous at first, but over many, many years, uh, this uh, uh, dampens down. But hopefully we prefer a vaccine to just get rid of it all. Yeah, that would be great. And fingers crossed it happens soon. Okay. so. Uh, another question that we received, um, so another outcome uh, and consequence of social distancing is feelings of isolation, feelings of loneliness, potentially depression. How, how do you recommend coping with that? What are things that we can be doing to protect our mental health during this time? Um, I guess I'll, I'll kind of get started. Um, 
I think it, a lot of communities are facing very, very unique struggles. And while we're all experiencing the pandemic, I think a lot of people are experiencing different issues. And I think the way we navigate that is one, there are, um, telemedicine has been, uh, I think there's been a resurgence of people using virtual medicine to be able to reach to people. And you now have access to providers that are not even in your city or in your state. And with that, there are, for example, I am um, able to still see my counselor and my psychologist over virtual counseling sessions. And I think that that's allowed me to actually have more access and it, it for it to be a little bit more accessible where I'm able to do it because I need to, I need to work every day. So I'm still able to get that time that I need to talk to someone in, in the workday. Um, and also I think it has helped me to understand what other people are going through because I think I still am incredibly, incredibly privileged that I have a job and I'm able to, you know, focus on my mental health and, and sometimes think about like self care and, about how I can do better. Um, but a lot of people that I'm talking to, e including friends that I know, are on food stamps and have been filing for unemployment and are, are struggling or they've been evicted now because those are no longer, evictions are no longer on hold. Um, and I think people are dealing with not just right mental health issues, but all of these serious issues that is, again, drastically impacting their mental health. And they can't address those issues unless they address the root cause of the problem, which is that they're, they're again, these lack of resources um, as an outcome of the fact that these people just were following guidelines and they had to stay home and they couldn't work and they lost their job. So that's so hard for us to, you know, I don't think people like my friends that are going through that can just talk to a counselor and resolve the, the serious, serious um, issues that are affecting their mental health capacity. Um, so I think, that's a harder problem. And for that, I think that's on us. That are we doing enough to take care of each other? Are we thinking about this when we're when we're voting? Are we thinking about this when we're advocating for marginalized communities? Are we thinking about our mental health then? I think that's when we need to have those have those thoughts because it's not on every individual who's suffering to take care of themselves. I think it's also on us to take care of our community. And that's what infectious diseases always reminds us of, right? This is not something we can do alone everyone is in this together. And if someone is doing something they're not supposed to be doing, we will all face repercussions. And I think that kind of makes us realize that we need to talk to each other and think about each other's needs and fight for each other, even though we might not know what everyone is facing, but do our best to learn and implement long-term change. So we're making sure that people's mental health is safeguarded when this happens again, not if, when this happens again. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, this is a big picture issue. Um, so for our final question, uh, I am going to ask one from our live chat. Um, someone asked that how, how they can, as a college student, help or contribute um, to the cause. So especially in ways to uh, limit risks for healthcare workers or to help those who are socially, socioeconomically disadvantaged, what are some ways that we can do, that we can help them? I can, I guess, start briefly and then we can go like a little bit around the horn. Um, so I think one thing that I've seen a lot of people do, which is really great, um, vol uh, volunteer if able at like the Houston Food Bank, um, being able to provide um, different resources and drives um, to people, especially those who are um, in need, being able to um, donate when you can to certain causes to be able to um, provide um, different resources to communities that are being more uh, affected in a harder manner um, and those that are on the front lines. Um, I guess also just supporting um, in the future when going to vote, um, remembering that being able to support um, research and also the healthcare system and being able to make real reform is something that's important. So you can use your power as a voter to be able to um, stress that these are important issues that need, be, need to be addressed. I don't know if anyone else wants um, to say anything. Yeah, I, I'll say I'll say one thing to that. I mean, one that was my favorite question because I think it's important for people to, again, figure out ways that they can uh, be in solidarity and help people, e given whatever they can do. Right? There's so many things that we can do. Sometimes, even from the uh, from just our homes, we can be implementing change. 
Um, so college students right now um, around the country are actually coming up with innovative ways that they can volunteer to get around um, some of the problems that communities are facing. So for example, healthcare workers are having to work, but daycares are closing. Um, so a lot of college students have put together like impromptu daycares or are starting to like serve as nannies for free where they just come up with a list of volunteers and then ask healthcare workers in their healthcare system if they can sign up um, for to and, and have someone come take care of their kid. And I mean, something as simple as that is just so important. And even beyond the framework of, of healthcare workers, I think, you know, marginalized communities hurt the hardest. So whatever problems they were already facing are now 10 times worse, right? So homeless shelters, domestic violence shelters, and they are finding ways to like food banks are opening up again and they need volunteers to put food boxes together, but they're finding ways to do that safely. They will provide you with a mask, they'll have sanitizers, and they just need people that are willing to get out there and do the work. Um, and I think finding those opportunities is um, easier than you think because people are looking for help. Um, another thing that you can do, I think, in your daily life is because there's a lot of people that are higher risk that cannot um, feel that safe going to do even groceries, for example, um, asking people in your circle, your friends and family that live close to you, if they can give you a grocery list and you can just go get groceries for them and drop it outside their door sanitized, that's again can go a long way and you might have just saved someone from from getting infection and a severe infection right because they're high risk um and ultimately i think in the long term um if you're interested in stem um i want to just give a shout out to the fact that there's so many different fields in the front lines there's the scientists that are working on their bench to try to figure out uh come up with innovative ways to find solutions, right? So all of the vaccines, all of the treatments, all of that started on the bench. And then there's physicians that are on the front line with other healthcare workers like nurses and respiratory specialists and PAs. And all of these people are directly taking care of patients, managing their daily, daily care, especially nurses. Nurses, I think, are people that, that get the least amount of attention and deserve the most amount of praise because they're the ones day in and day out sometimes managing 10, 15 COVID patients a day and taking care of their every need. They're the ones that are next to their bedside if the COVID patient is passing away and their family members can't say goodbye. And they're the ones mediating that sort of, um, that sort of grieving process, right? And I think looking into how in the long term where you can fit in this system such that you can empower yourself to have the tools to be able to get there and then be able to implement change right? Because we're seeing so many issues. As scientists, we know what we're not doing enough of. So for example, there's so many scientists right now sitting, you know, not able to go back to lab, but they, they know how to do a PCR and they know how to do high complexity molecular techniques that can, if with the right training and the right supervision, be used to deploy testing for a lot of people, right? But we just don't have the mechanism. We don't have that plan because that, that kind of system needs to exist already where the moment a pandemic hits, you go, all right, we need 30 people here, 40 people here, go, right? And you can't create those systems in the middle of an emergency. So I think we're realizing all of the ways that we need to do better after this. Um, so I think I just encourage you to, especially if you are a young scientist or looking to be a scientist or a doctor or any kind of healthcare professional, um, find that motivation for what makes you tick and what you love, whether it's community service or whether it's change and take that like, you know, take that desire to change things and maybe even anger because a lot of us are angry right now that we're in this position and channel it towards that. Channel it towards empowering yourself to be in a position where you can take care of people and implement long-term change. And I think that's way more powerful than even us feeling right now that we're not doing much, right? Because this is about the long term. We're in a marathon. We're not in this for, for, for right now. Yeah, and I just want to add really quickly. Um, one, I love that people are so compassionate and they, uh, you know, for people out there. Um, uh, another thing I'd like to add, um, which was all fabulous suggestions uh, by the two other panelists was just to um, talk to your family members as well. Um, starting these conversations uh, to, you know, uh, maybe they can help you, maybe they can uh, help you think about it a different way, or you might even change some people's minds because not everyone 
is as compassionate as you are, unfortunately. Um, and by talking about it with them, hopefully um, we can spark um, some interest in better humanity out there. Yeah, and I encourage everyone to fill out the survey uh, that Miranda just posted because it includes uh, a field to enter your email. Um, because what we want to do after this is make sure that we're um, giving you opportunities to be able to stick, stick, stick with us and stay connected. Uh, we're hosting two panels uh, in the summer. Uh, one of them is going to be about how to read and communicate science and dissect science, even if it's complicated. Um, that's going to be on Wednesday, June 17th at 11 a.m. Um, and everyone can attend that and it's open and we can send you an email uh, invite. Uh, for it. And then the second one is on June 30th at 11 a.m. Uh, we're doing a panel on higher education and science and medicine, uh, where we're going to be talking about the tools and resources that you need to navigate um, STEM. Um, and besides that, uh, like Miranda said, I think what we want to do is give you the resources uh, in terms of things that you can read in your own time to be able to educate yourself and inform yourself about what communities that have been hit the hardest by COVID are really going through day in and day out. Um, and we do have a list of resources that we compiled. So if you do enter your email, um, then we'll find a way to get those to you. Yeah, great. Uh, we learned a whole lot today. Thank you so much to our wonderful panelists and everything um, that they shared and that they answered uh, with, with the questions. Um, so we learned about the science behind uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, what happens in an outbreak, the public health response, disease diagnosis, vaccine development, so many, so many things. Um, we also talked about how a pandemic most severely affects those who are vulnerable in our community and some ways that we hope to prevent this in the future. I hope that this webinar was informative and helpful to everyone in our audience today as we now live in a COVID-19 world. And I especially hope that our young people feel empowered to use this information for good, that we can make better choices to promote health in our communities, and also that we are stimulated to act compassionately to those who are most vulnerable. This may be in small ways, like wearing a face mask and social distancing, or it can be in big ways, such as organizing uh, food donations or working with organizations that fight against health disparities among minority populations. Um, like Aisha said, uh, if you're interested in further information on the other panels that we're going to be having, please fill out the survey so we can email you about that. Um, and again, we just want to thank you so much for joining today. Uh, additional questions, you can also email us at asm at tmc at gmail.com. So thank you so much for joining and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Hey there. Okay. I'm gonna